Good morning, everybody. A very warm welcome from Switzerland at the moment, where it's early in the morning. And guess what? It's snowing for the first time in 2021 winter time today. So it's really beautiful outside, but I'm happy to be in this cozy, warm room uh, and virtual space with you today. This is uh, our plenary panel session on China's future growth and reforms, of course, a very important, crucial and timely topic with what's going on in the world. This will last from 5.30 a.m. to 6.15 a.m. GMT, so 45 minutes of very interesting topics and discussions. My name is Martina Fox. I'm a TV journalist and uh, anchor based in Zurich and London, working for a China Xinhua news agency, among other mandates and projects. It's now my great pleasure to welcome on our virtual stage, first of all, Roger King. He is uh, the founder and chairman of ODS Holdings based in Hong Kong. We are also hoping to get on this uh, call a bit later. David Pan, the executive dean of the Schwarzman College at Tsinghua University in China, as well as Wang Dong, his executive director at the Institute for Global Cooperation and Understanding in Beijing. I understand that we are still waiting for the gentlemen to join, but hopefully we can get them onto this virtual panel as soon as possible. I would first of all like to ask you, Roger, to maybe dig a little bit deeper into your own background and tell us how you view uh, China's growth and reforms to kick it off with. Sure. Thank you very much. And thanks, uh, everyone from uh, different parts of the world. Uh, so uh, myself, uh, my name is Roger King. Uh, I'm an ethnic Chinese, but born in the United States. Uh, my parents, uh, my father was the first one from his family to go overseas to study in the United States. And uh, so I was born there. And uh, I uh, managed to go back to China uh, after World War II. So you know now how old I am. Okay. And anyway, we stayed in China for a while. And I had two older brothers that were left behind in China with the grandparents uh, when my parents uh, went to the uh, United States to study itself. OK, so I, I didn't really meet them until, you know, uh, I went back. And uh, so it was kind of interesting. Uh, this is uh, 1946. And, uh, you know, this is just a pre uh, period when the communists uh, were uh, you know, uh, having, you know, the uh, issues. And we actually, this, the family was ready, getting ready to leave Shanghai. We were in Shanghai to go back to uh, basically uh, 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 United States. Uh, but uh, uh, my grandparents uh, during the war, uh, World War II, they went to Chongqing. And anyhow, uh, to make the story short, uh, we decided to stay behind. And uh, so I actually was in China during the uh, uh, early days of the uh, communists, and we actually saw the uh, soldiers marching in and everything else. They were very, very polite, okay, very, very polite. Uh, we had a, a very large house with a lot of uh, land in the city itself because we're part of my, my grandparents are uh, Bank of China, you know, directors of Bank of China. So the soldiers actually came and knocked on our door and asked, permission to stay on a ground floor. So we, the whole family, we had to, you know, the dining room, living room, and everything else, we all moved upstairs. So this is quite an interesting uh, experience. And uh, so I just want to leave that, you know, uh, so I have an exposure to the uh, 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 communist China uh, a little bit. But later on, we actually left uh because my older brother, who is four years older than I, he uh, decided uh, at the age of 14 to join the People Liberation Army without asking permission. So in those days, it's very, very difficult for the family to stop them, because if we stop them, uh, we think we might be liable. But mm -hmm. I have my brother to thank, because because he joined, we honestly decided and we left. And we so I finally returned to the United States. So I've been in the United States for, for a long time. And uh, then I, I, I studied and uh, so forth. And uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later on. But uh, it was interesting that I came back to uh, Hong Kong. I've been in, living in Hong Kong since 1975. I started a company called ODS. And uh, this was a 
uh, computer distribution company. And uh, so this was a uh, long time, was a very successful venture. Uh, we still keep it. It's no longer uh, involved in that. It's primarily a uh, holding company for a lot of other activities we have. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, at a, a rather late age, I decided to complete my educational process and went back and got my PhD at the age of 66. Wow. And, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, yeah. And I, I was asked to, uh, uh, you know, join the faculty. So I'm now on the faculty of uh, uh, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. And I focus on uh, Asian family, family businesses and entrepreneurship. And, of course, now family office itself. So this will give you a little background. I'm mm-hmm. sorry, it's been a little bit too long-winded. Uh-huh. This was a very long introduction, but it's well worth it. You should write your autobiography or get someone else to write it. It's such a fascinating story. And thank you so much, Roger, for providing this background. Now, I would say, like, you have seen it all. Um, you have seen, you know, the start of Chinese economic development up until now. If we talk about the future now, and especially because you're in Hong Kong with a very volatile situation there as well, how bullish or bearish are you when it comes to the next couple of years? Well, I, I'm uh, very, uh, well, I would say cautiously bullish, okay, because I, I do believe that uh, things are happening in China and for the better better of uh, the uh, uh, community as a whole. Uh, what China has accomplished in the last 40 years. And I've seen a lot of that myself uh, because I, uh, besides a computer computer distribution business, I was also in uh, offshore oil uh, drilling business. And uh, I was one of the first ones to drill offshore in the South China Sea. No. And uh, uh, also the first ones to uh, sign, sign an agreement with CNOOC, which is China National Offshore Oil Company itself. So I... I, I been inside. Uh, I have, uh, you, you know, uh, seen a lot. I've met a lot of uh, high-ranking officials in China. In fact, uh, I used to uh, uh, be a member of the CPPCC of uh, Zhejiang Province. Uh, the, you know, I was asked to. So uh, my Chinese is very, very bad. But uh, anyhow, they they still uh, invited me to join. I was a standing committee member of that. By the way, I'm a, a U.S. citizen. I still maintain my U.S. citizenship. <laughs> yes, yes. You know, talking about Zhejiang province um, and, uh, of course, Hangzhou, the digital capital of China, which is in uh, Zhejiang province. I just got back from there, actually. And, of course, because of COVID-19, it's not really easy, first of all, to get a visa. And uh, then also, secondly, to go through the quarantine period, which was uh, three weeks. I was three weeks in quarantine and three weeks out. Um, and I hadn't been back since uh, the start of the pandemic. So, of course, China has changed a lot. The decoupling is real. China has been isolating itself over the last um, uh, couple of months, of course, reclosing uh, the borders. But what I have seen is that the national economy, of course, is growing massively uh, with all the digital economy and um, the new policies and so on. Um, Do you think that the Chinese government will open borders again very soon. I hear that after the party congress, most probably in October, which will, of course, also help to boost again and promote cultural exchange. Yes. uh, Well, we here in Hong Kong, of course, have have a very uh, strict rule. Uh, Anyone coming to Hong Kong, uh, irrespective of uh, where, uh, is uh, required to, uh, even with the uh, the the uh, vaccination and everything else. It's a three week quarantine period itself. So for for the last two months, I think we ha- only had one local case. Okay, we've had some imported cases, unfortunately. But anyway, it's very very strict. But there's now discussion uh, between uh, Hong Kong and the uh, Chinese side to see if our common borderline could be open. So that that certainly would help a lot. And of course, you know, Hong Kong is uh, uh, dependent on a a lot of uh, businesses from uh, China itself. Uh, So I think uh, by opening up the uh, border, uh, it will uh, increase the not just uh, local tourism and so forth and so on, but I'm talking about high level uh, business and uh, especially our uh, stock exchange is very, very important to uh, China itself, even though they now start developing their own uh, 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 
exchanges as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would like to actively involve uh, our audience here as well, all the people in the room. So please feel free to contribute either with remarks or questions uh, so that we can have a very active and uh, dynamic uh, interaction here as well. So feel free to ask uh, questions um, at the bottom of your screen or raise your hand so we can definitely involve you or I, I can get you on the virtual stage maybe as well. Now, I was just yesterday here in Lucerne in uh, Switzerland Roger at the Europe Forum, where China was at uh, the topic. We also had the former Australian Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, of course, a very um, you know well known. Yes, he's now the uh, head of uh, Asia Society. Asia Society as well, and the fluent Mandarin speaker too. Um, so he was also what you say said cautiously optimistic about uh, the future outlook. Of course, we cannot ignore the geopolitical situation as well. And um, I guess the Xi Biden uh, meeting was kind of, um, you know, showing that there is again a dialogue going on. So hopefully we can continue that as well. Now, the International Monetary Fund expects uh, this year's uh, GDP growth of China to expand by 8% and then slow down a little bit uh, to 5.6% in uh, 2022. This is just a normal trajectory, I would say, after this uh, very massive expansion over the last couple of um, years. W which are some of maybe, you know, the positives, but also the challenges that you see from um, y your, you know, place in Hong Kong right now when you look at the mainland? Uh, sure. You, you, you know, obviously, uh, you, you know, the uh, China's in transition at the moment. And I think, uh, uh, you know, the uh, du dual circulation, you know, the concept of dual circulation and uh, so forth. Uh, well, I think, you, you, you know, the meeting between uh, Xi Jinping and uh, uh, Joe Biden, uh, I, I don't think people expect a lot to come out of it. But the fact that as a dialogue, it's still helpful. But you can see very uh, clearly that uh, Biden is not really addressing the uh, the real problem. To me, he's really uh, trying to uh, fend himself uh, amongst the uh, his own constituents uh, because of obviously uh, they, they're concerned about the 2022 uh, congressional election, of course, uh, 2024. And uh, so I think, uh, you, you know, the... Uh, so he's more looking inwardly, uh, addressing these issues, where, whereas I think China is trying to. So the question is that whether or not this decoupling uh, will uh, you know, be over soon. Uh, I think uh, personally, uh, unfortunately, I don't think it will be over soon. Uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, now Donald Trump is thinking of rerunning again. Uh, so, but even if the Donald doesn't run, you know, basically both the Republican and the uh, Democrats, uh, he, you know, they, they tend to blame everything on uh, on China today. OK, so I think uh, China, of course, uh, as a result of this, is uh, recognizing that, you know, from now on, uh, you know, to rely on outside uh engagement, assistance, and so forth. And so so it, I, I would call it a sort of a, the Sputnik moment where, you know, you now realize you have to really start de developing your own technology and everything else. Uh, so, you, you know, at this stage, uh, it's, it's not very uh, encouraging. Uh, so China is moving in a direction of self-sufficiency. Uh, and, and yet it still will depend on uh, both the internal development of its own economy, but, uh, you know, the uh, the uh, middle cl class is rising. But at the same time, it still uh, need the uh, export uh, where, uh, you know, uh, trade relationship. And, of course, you know, we can, we can talk about the issue of Belt and Road and so forth and so on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, COP26 and uh, green finance and climate change, these are areas of common interest. So I believe that we should find these, uh, you know, common uh, challenges for the world where we can really collaborate uh, together as well. And uh, Xi Jinping and uh, Joe Biden, they have also discussed during their meeting to really collaborate on the climate front together and maybe even use American technology. So there are definitely signs of hope as well. But of course, there are other competitive areas and a lot of competition going on in space 
for example, right now with all the space missions, but also military expenditures and, and um, uh, nuclear weapons and so on. So you have a lot of pros, but you definitely have a lot of cons um, as well. But I do believe that climate change, sustainability are really topics that will shape, of course, the future of the world and where we could see a lot of collaborations going forward as well. Well, I think, uh, you, you know, there are certainly a lot of opportunities for collaboration. But again, you know, when you talk about the COP26 and, uh, you know, Biden was saying, oh, how come Xi Jinping didn't show up? OK. And uh, the fact that is uh, Xi Jinping has not left China uh, for 600 days. Uh, he just, you know, uh, feels that, you know, with the COVID situation, it's probably better to stay behind. Mm -hmm. And uh, but that's not an indication of uh, non-commitment. You, you know, the people think the fact that he didn't show up uh, is a uh, indication. But, you know, they have very, very uh, clear plans of what they want to do over the period of time. And uh, so far within the last 40 years, most of the plans uh, that uh, China states they have met. OK. And sometimes uh, uh, earlier than schedule itself. So. This is something. So the fact that Xi Jinping didn't physically show up, okay? But, you, you know, let, let, let's face it. If uh, Donald Trump wins again, will he honor the uh, uh, COP26? 20, uh, you know, he's the one who walked out of the uh, the uh, Paris Agreement, right? So, he, he, you know, uh, so, and other people will say talk is cheap. You know, let, let, let's see some action, you, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think Biden... Hopefully, you know, he'll put his own politics behind and really move forward and try to get things done. And I think there are opportunities uh, right now for uh, collaboration between, you know, China and, and, and United States. I think on the Chinese side, the uh, indications are they definitely are interested in collaborating. On the American side, I'm not sure. OK, you, you know, I'm an American citizen. I pay U.S. tax, uh, you know. Uh, Oh, the other thing I forgot to mention, you know, I mentioned my brother was a uh, PLA soldier, right? Well, uh, after I graduated from university, I was actually uh, a naval, U.S. naval officer. So mm -hmm. in one family, you have a PLA soldier and a U.S. naval officer. Yeah. So you had a lot of heated discussions or was it a peaceful <laughs> household? Yeah, it's uh, well, you know, I didn't actually get to see my brother because he was in China. and We were in the United States until... He, 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 you know, in, uh, until 1979, before he came back. So he's now physically in Hong Kong as well. So yeah, you we're, are proof we're still of right. peaceful coexistence and collaboration, right? Yes, in one uh, family, yes. under uh, one roof. It yeah. can be done. It just needs a lot of will, a lot of work, and a lot of understanding as well. And this Absolutely. is made also the cultural component, which is so important. I would call this a, a cognitive empathy. We just need to develop dialogue. We need to put ourselves into the other person's shoes and really understand the cultures much, much better. But I would also argue that this is just not possible right now because uh, we have closed borders. So traveling between China and the West is so, so difficult. I'm getting um, a request from George Wang to join the stage. I will let him in here right now. George, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I'm yes, here. Uh, Hey, tell Hi, us, first of all, who you are. Introduce yourself very briefly, please. Uh, yeah, uh, this is George. I'm based here in uh, Oregon in the U.S. Oregon, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm uh, running a company uh, 21 years doing the uh, contract manufacturing, you know, so we have uh, uh, factories and, and our companies in Shenzhen, you know, Ningbo, you just went there. And Beijing and also Hanoi, uh, Malaysia and uh, India, you know, Hyderabad. So many different places. Of course, the majority of uh, work is really still done in China in the last in the last one and a half years, well almost two years, the pandemic thing happens, you know, luckily we have China, you know, operating almost 24 hour a day, supporting, supplying everything to the world. Mm -hmm. You know, um, without that, 
<laughs> there are a lot of household people you know, will be in big trouble even yeah. till today with all the logistic problems that's still there. China is still an engine of growth and uh, supply for the rest of the world, right? As long as the supply chains do not get disrupted. So how do you see China's growth at the moment and reforms, Georgia? What are some of your worries and maybe some of the opportunities that you're seeing? Well, you know, uh, our company headquarter uh, is here in, uh, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And from uh, being a businessman, my wish you know, it's really the whole world in peace, mm -hmm. not the geopolitical thing. Because yeah. I, from my understanding, we have a lot of clients from Fortune 500 company, you know, or the smaller ones. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of work, all internationally distributed. Uh, mm -hmm. To be honest, you know, we try to hire a lot of people locally in mm -hmm. the UI. There's, mm -hmm. no, there's no resource left, yeah. right? You yeah. cannot get anything done because there are no people. So we have like a 20 job opening, not even one <laughs> can be filled. Okay, uh, anybody looking for work in this group, please reach out to George. Well, <laughs> yeah, anyway. So we, so we do have uh, our team in uh, our wholly owned subsidiary, you know, in yeah. China there. Also, you know, in Vietnam, in different places. Mm. You know, so you can diversify the business a little bit, huh? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, now nowadays, I think, you know, um, even for American business, right, mm -hmm. the clients are worldwide. Yeah. So very few business other than the bread <laughs> you're yes. selling the bakery is really local. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, every customer, you know, they're selling worldwide, even American mm -hmm. company. They may be made in China. And then you look at the tier two, tier three, they may be from every other country too, right? Yeah. So it's all intertwined together. Now with all the geopolitical things happening, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, the prosperity of the world, yeah. that's in a bigger question. I, I think, you know, from the business world, that's, you know, this COVID, right? Every country, the people are suffering. Who, okay, U.S. US had the advantage of, of printing more money <laughs> to yeah. artificially bail out. Uh, <laughs> you know, George, your company is also a proof and reflection of the fact that there is no uh, deglobalization. I mean, the world is so interconnected and intertwined. We cannot really stop that trend, even though it's more digital, it's more virtual right now. Um, some people call it a digital cold war. Um, I wouldn't probably go that far, um, but it's definitely a difficult state of affair right now. I would like to get Mr. Charles Andrew Tung uh, onto our virtual stage here as well. He's from the Bra Brazil China Chamber of Commerce. Hello, Charles. Can you hear and see us? He wanted just to join, but I think he dropped out again. Charles, if you can hear and see us, please join us back again. Um, Roger, so um, we, of course, um, have also... Uh, yeah, he's coming back, so... Oh, that was George again. No. Okay. Wonderful. No, he's not coming. All right. So, Roger, of course, uh, we had a very big goal that was achieved as well about um, a year ago, precisely. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Charles, sorry. Oh, Charles is here. Yeah. Give him a chance. Charles? Charles, can you hear us? Uh, seems not to work. Okay. Oh, yes. Now it works. There he is. <laughs> How, are you? How are you? Long distance call, isn't it? <laughs> so for the connection. Tell us um, who you are, a quick introduction, and then what your question or what your contribution is. Sure. Hi, just I want to say uh, hi to my old friend, Roger. Haven't yeah. seen you for a long time because of COVID. Yes. <laughs> and uh, yeah, my name is Charles Tang. Uh, I'm the chairman of the Brazil-China Chamber of Commerce, and I'm also the president of the Brazilian Association of Waste to Energy and Hydrogen. Wow. Yeah. Uh, we, you know, we all have to collaborate to have a, a cleaner world. Yeah. 
So uh, my what I would like to say is that you know I had the uh, <clears throat> I was able to meet uh, I had a meeting with uh, <clears throat> Joe Biden many many years ago before he was a vice president. He was uh, just a senator at the time, and he seemed like a very uh, clever and very decent person, a kind person. However, I'm a bit disappointed that uh, instead of a win-win engagement between the two largest powers of the world, we continue this lose-lose engagement. And the question is, will the U.S. really be able to impede China's advance? I don't believe so. I think that both countries will lose from this confrontation, and in the end, China will continue growing. Because you can't just stop China from growing, okay? No matter what the United States does, it's not going to happen. So instead of collaborating to do a lot of good for the humanity, can you imagine the two great powers collaborating to help to build rather than to destroy? You know. This would be such a perfect uh, future, isn't it, uh, George? Uh, would you agree with um, uh, uh, Roger? Would you agree with uh, Charles here? Absolutely. I, I think you know. I mean, to you know, to try to contain uh, China today is just not the right thing to do. Okay, and uh, you know. What, Why look at things as if we're in a competitive environment? You know, why can't we live, coexist, and all benefit from things? You know, each each culture culturally we're very very different, but we still can coexist and benefit from each other. You know, the fact that you know, as I said, I'm really sort of bi culture in a way, and so you know, I can understand the Chinese culture. I understand the Western culture as well. And I, I, I'm still here, right? <laughs> so you, you know, but the thing is, you, you know, we have to accept that different people from different parts of the world culturally are very different. That does not mean they're enemies, and there are ways to coexist and benefit from each other, learn from each other. Mm -hmm. you, you know, that that's that's one of the key. You know, I, I, I mentioned I study family, family businesses. Part of my current research is also I'm looking at the uh, I'm doing a comparative study between uh, overseas Chinese family businesses to Jewish diaspora family businesses and Indian diaspora family. What are the similarities and differences? You, you know, these are things that and, uh, you, you know, all three cultures, are, you know, these uh, uh, ethnic groups are very, very successful around the world. And there are yeah. more similarities than differences. But I'm Absolutely. worried about the next and the future generations because right now with COVID uh, and, you know, the restricted travel um, opportunities and, and um, the social media bubble that we all live in, I feel like the young people, the millennials, the Gen Z, they're so limited in their space and not really getting the opportunity to meet other people, other cultures and really broaden their horizons as well. So this could definitely be a worry. Um, there are, of course, phenomena of um, xenophobia and racism now as well because of the origin of the pandemic as well so this is definitely very very um you know a, a worrying trend as well i would like to get two inputs from the floor as well we have annette uh, nice she would like to ask how do you think and stay with us charles uh, in this uh, conversation i'm going to get george right back here as well he would like to rejoin our, our virtual stage and everybody's welcome of course annette would like to ask How do you think about business in China? Do you expect businesses to change as they are becoming concerned how consumers view their presence in China? What do you think, you know, maybe looking at uh, China from your Hong Kong perspective, Roger, uh, what is your view on business in China? I mean, I recently saw an American chamber survey, I think it was in September, or October, which ex actually said that most of the American U.S. companies are not planning to leave China, which was a very, you know, sending an optimistic note as well. Yeah. 
Well, you, you, you know, um, most economies, uh, you know, whether the United States, uh, Europe, or, or uh, even China, you know, the so-called SMEs, uh, small, medium uh, size, uh, and most of them are family controlled, are, uh, you, you know, the, the provide the, the main thrust, uh, you, you know, uh, probably uh, uh, engage, uh, you know, in terms of employment, uh, 80 plus percent of the uh, employment is actually from these SME or family or family businesses. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in China today, uh, you know, many of them are very, very successful, but there are certain challenges. Uh, I'll talk about that. And I know you might want to uh, address that issue as a separate thing, but I'll, I'll bring this up also. You know, these uh, people that have done extremely well usually send their de- descendant overseas to study. And many of them uh, go to the United States. In fact, uh, currently there are over 300,000 uh, 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 from uh, mainland China studying in the United States at the moment, contributing more than a billion dollars uh, uh, annually to, to the economy itself. But what's really interesting is that when they go back to China, most of them do not want to join the family business because they think the family business is, the, you know, it's a, it's a passe and they all want to start their own venture. So this is one of the challenges of the, these uh, businesses in China today itself. And so uh, especially for ethnic Chinese, we tend to pass the business on to the next generation and there's no one to pass it on to because the next generation wants to do, do something entirely different. Mm-hmm. So this is a, a major challenge in how can these businesses survive? You, you, you know, we, you, you know, the, the, this is a challenge. I, I, I just throw it on the table here. And of course, providing a level playing field as well. The European, you know, China Chamber of Commerce has really focused on that for so many years that we need the same uh, opportunities, the same chances for overseas business as well in China. But right now, as so many foreigners have left and cannot go back to China because of the visa issues and so on, and you know, they think it's a little bit of a hostile environment now as well. Of course, um, the government is giving priority to all the national champions and startups and so on. So it's really a very difficult situation. Uh, Charles and George, would you like to add to this uh, point as well? Uh, yes, actually, I think your topic about the China is the this is a, the best section mm-hmm. session on the on the discussion. I so I've been living in the U.S. for thirty years. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of like observed what China has been evolving in the last 30 years. I come to the United States uh, on the August 14th, 1990. You know, that's when China still really backward, you know, backward. But anyway, long story short, I think China has a lot of problem with that huge country, right? They try to grow. They try to solve problems. So every day... I went back and forth doing business. You see, there's all the headaches, right? And I think they try to learn a lot from uh, the British system, from the American system. Like when there were this uh, two, 2000, uh, 2008 problem happens, right? And what are you going to do with the economy? I think, just my observation wise, they're, you know, effective, effectively learn from the US from the, the microeconomy theory, build the, build the road, build the freeway. So invest a lot of money to bring the economy back, you know, back up, right? So that's what China, literally, my observation, personal opinion, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. called the American way in the 1960s, you know, earlier, how to put all the infrastructure everywhere, right? Even to the remote village, build housing, you know. The other thing is, Talking about the, the growth, uh, the poverty. You know, the, in China, in the old days, they have 1.4 billion people, maybe maybe like a, 1 billion people in, in, in a bad condition back then. Mm-hmm. So they come up with this uh, 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 the government uh, supported program helping the poor people, most of them, you know, build their house. I think something that they need to learn. I, I think even in the U.S., how do you treat those people that mm-hmm. step out from the information age, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. They need help. You don't let them go crazy on the street. We live in Portland. You see mm-hmm. the street, they're, they're rebelling again. They just, and then the homeless everywhere. But you say, okay, you are free to be, 
but they, they need to be taken care of. Somebody yeah. needs to help them. Cannot they cannot compete, right? Mm. And then they lost their mind with the drugs and everything. Right. Somehow, Charles? Help them. Yeah. So I would like oh I'm sorry. Charles, George. please Wait. jump in. Yes? Yeah. Uh, I'm like uh, Roger, I'm also tricultural because you know uh, my entire family is American. I was transferred to Brazil by an investment bank on Wall Street. And then uh, the second time I came back to Brazil with uh, transferred by the Bank of Boston. Incredible. And what I'm afraid, mm -hmm. what I see that's very dangerous is the demonization of China. Because the American people are becoming, you know, they, they, they look at China and say they're the enemy. Yeah. And, you know, these things can be self-fulfilling. And although I don't believe there will be a war between the United States and China, because both sides have too much to lose, but, you know, you can have skirmishes. Yes. And like in the Vietnam War, you know, the, the, the Vietnamese were gooks. You know, they weren't human. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and, and this is a very dangerous uh, thing that's happening. Yes. Okay. Would you call this a clash of civilization even? I mean, the xenophobia, racism, the finger pointing, the scapegoating, because we live in such a decoupled world right now is really increasing. Or do you think we are not there yet and hopefully can avoid this kind of state um, and, and situation? I don't, I don't even think it's so much of racism. It's just that the American people, goaded by their presidents, goaded by the policies and the herd mentality of the journalists is painting a picture where China is the devil. Yeah. And, you know, we have to destroy the devil. Mm. Mm. And that is very, very dangerous. Although, as we all know, China has never fought a war since 1979. And as President Carter says, the United States has never been out of a war since <laughs> its independence except for 16 years, you know, since the independence of the United States. So China has no ambition to conquer anyone, but you know, the Americans are saying China wants to conquer everything. So we have to stop China from conquering and invading and sending military. It's, you know, it's so, it's so paranoid and mm -hmm. things can get out of control through this. Absolutely. I would like to take one last question, maybe from the floor, from Jim Yuan. He's partner of Choi View Education. Uh, he would like to ask this panel um, any views on the extent of demographic pressures, for example, birth rates on long term growth prospects and impacts which is very important, uh, demographics, of course. What I've noticed during my recent trip to uh, China is that, of course, you have this term in Chinese, nu, which is leftover woman. Any woman above the age of 30 or so without children, you know, will have a difficult time finding a husband or getting, um, yes, uh, having kids. <laughs> Uh, and this phenomenon is definitely growing. Like a lot of women I've met between the age of um, 28, even up to 40, they do not want to get married. They don't want to have children. They want to have liberties and, and, and freedom and their own career. They're also worried about what's going on in the world, geopolitics and COVID and so on. So I guess we will see an a decrease in birth rates uh, going forward, even though that is a main worry, of course, for the Chinese government as well, since uh, the end of the one-child policy. Uh, what do you gentlemen think about this? Demographic, you know, the pressure on long-term growth. If I may, I call that uh, capitalism birth control and plus the one-child policy. I think that will be a major, major problem for China. Yeah. You know, uh, then the population aging you know that's uh, that's a major issue right now we're working with a lot of factories they are really buying all the robots arms in the factory floor because hiring people in china is equally difficult yes. <laughs> believe it or not so that's a yeah that's a major issue mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the aging population is uh, another uh, main concern you know the low birth rate uh, you know is uh, other problem and you know by culturally 
Uh, you know, it's always the younger generation take care of the older generation. Now, you know, one child has to, you have four grandparents you have to worry about. You know, this is a major, major challenge itself. And how, you know, the, uh, the government is uh, uh, trying to uh, address these things. But the part of the reason why the low birth rate is that, uh, you, you know, the, uh, uh, these families don't have enough to, to you know, they, they feel obligated to, to get the best for their, their child. And if they have two, they just don't have enough uh, resources to make sure that the next generation is well taken care of so they can move forward. And, you know, education, is, of course, is very, very important itself and uh, job opportunities and so forth and so on. So this is why they should prefer to say, OK, one one is fine. OK, uh, that's all the, the space we have in our apartment. This is all the money we have in terms of uh, educating them. Yeah. Charles, anything uh, to add from your side? Yeah, I think that uh, I, I do not believe, I mean, of course, like uh, Roger said, you know, it's going to be tough for one kid to take, uh, you know, one couple to take care of four, you know, people, grandparents. And uh, that is going to be a problem. But because of the evolution of technology, I don't think that it will be such a problem in terms of having the businesses running because a lot of things will be automatic, you know, <laughs> and like the industries are going to use robots and, and things like that. I hope that not robots will uh, take care of us uh, when we get old. <laughs> I hope that we will still have a human care system, hopefully, though. Yeah. Robots. So I believe yeah. that, uh, you know, I don't think it, w it will be a problem, but I don't think it's going to be such a grave problem as to impede China's growth. No. Yeah. I believe I that China will continue growing. Yes. You know, one niche market I've always been thinking about uh, in terms of business in China would, of course, be old age pension homes, you know, homes for the elderly and new care facilities as well. But still up to this point, it's just such a cultural thing that you take care of your parents and your grandparents that this business model has not really taken off yet but maybe that will be something to keep an eye on for the future as well for anybody wanting to do business in china no yeah well, i well, think several companies are already yeah. really doing well yes yeah healthcare is a is an industry that one should really address yeah you know mm -hmm. one of the biggest problems right now is uh, as charles says you know we're all living longer you know we all have relatives or friends of uh parents that are 100 years or more you, you know uh, I mean, the average ex uh, life expectancy is increasing uh, tremendously. The, the, this is a thing, you know. And, uh, well, you know, uh, uh, I'm getting there soon <laughs> to uh, worry about who's going to take care of me, right? <laughs> no, Robot. I hope so, Roger. I'm sure you have a lot of wonderful people around you. Thank you. Yes, I do. <laughs> we are just about two minutes um, uh, until the end of this session. So I would maybe like to come to a conclusion and say that uh, we all agree, I think, on this panel that we are cautiously optimistic when it comes uh, to the future growth and opportunities in China, despite all the freezing, snowy here in Switzerland, headwinds that the country is facing, but we do face decoupling issues, um, still the technology war, maybe competition in space, you know, the fight um, against COVID-19 is far from over, as we see with the recent outbreak uh, in South Africa now as well, and the new variant, and of course, uh, the strategic competition between China and the US, which is worrying everybody around the world, also here in Europe. Uh, maybe a short closing remark from all the gentlemen, and I'm grateful that you could join um, and spontaneously jump on board, Charles and George as well. Roger, of course, maybe a very quick 30 seconds uh, closing remark. Mark, we start with Roger. Well, I'm, uh, as I said, I'm uh, overall optimistic, uh, in, in our cautiously optimistic about China, but I'm also cautiously optimistic about the whole world, too. You know, we just have to get up this race, okay? We, let's work together. Thank you so much. George? Uh, actually, follow up your earlier question, uh, American business in China 
it's almost uh, close to one trillion dollar in China. You know, seven hundred billion above. Everywhere you go, like my parents down there, you got Walmart and the stores. They have all the American products. The problem is, in the U.S., the politicians they don't know, they don't see that, right? Have nothing to do with the domestic politics. There are American in, influence everywhere in the in the in the Chinese people's life in there. But、uh, over here in the U.S., you see American. Brand the product probably made in China,、yeah. <laughs> but in China is the other <laughs> way. Global citizens, right? You cannot get the global citizen out of us anymore. It's part of our identity as well, personally, of course. Thank you, Charles. I think that China is going through another transformation. You know the different phases, and now the common prosperity, which I think is a, a very valuable、uh, contribution to society. You know why should we have you know trillionaires and people starving? Okay, so to have common prosperity is a fantastic ideal, and China has also been the only country in the history of human kind been able to eradicate extreme poverty. Absolutely. Okay, so I think that th- this vision of a new model for China、uh, is a very healthy vision. And of course, also very good for business because when you ha- eradicate poverty and have more people with money to spend, it's very good for business. You know, so、uh, I-, I believe that、uh, you know, like、uh, Roger said,、uh, I just hope that there won't be any major disruptions between the and China today is circling its wagon because once again the Western powers are aligning themselves. To gang up on China,、yeah. you know, China went through a century of humiliation in the hands of the West, the same Western powers、mm-hmm. who are now ganging on China. Of course, China has to, and then people say, "Well, China's building more weapons." Well, of course, it has to build more weapons because they don't want to cede Hong Kong again, they don't want to cede Shanghai again, and things like that. You know.、Mm-hmm. Absolutely, thank you so so much, gentlemen. We have a lot of work to do, of course, but we all want the win-win situation. We cannot afford anything else for us and、uh, the next generations to come as well. I would like to thank you, Roger, of course, for being in this panel, and absolutely also、uh, Charles and George for spontaneously joining us. It's been a fascinating discussion. I wish you a very interesting rest of the Horasis Asia meeting. Connect with us on LinkedIn on. All the other social media platforms. I look very forward to staying in touch and wish you all a nice rest of the day from Switzerland. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. See you again, George. Bye. Bye. See you soon. Bye, George. Great to、thank、connect.、You. Yeah. Thank you. Okay.